now. On 105.9 FM and streaming worldwide on the WMAL app. O'Connor and Company. It's 6.07 here this Tuesday morning in your nation's capital. Thanks for tuning in here to O'Connor and Company as we continue to deliver updates on this horrific catastrophe in Baltimore Harbor. The Francis Scott Key Bridge struck by a cargo ship at 1.30 this morning, and the major bulk of the span collapsed into the river. Rescue operations underway as we speak. Sadly, more questions than answers at this point, but we do have a video of the event that is incredibly uh, vivid and clear in terms of the moment of impact and the events leading up to it with the ship seemingly losing power, uh, possible engine failures at the time that uh, leaves it sort of drifting, and it drifted straight into a pylon there that supports this third largest continuous truss bridge in the world. Uh, joining us later in the program in 30 minutes, Richard Goldberg, Foundation for Defense of Democracies, on the U.N. vote forcing a ceasefire in Israel. 705, Governor Scott Walker. 735, Hung Kao running for Senate. 805, Andy McCarthy. And then 835, Jenny Tear on the border. I'm Larry O'Connor, and, and Julie Gunlock is on a border of her own. You're right there on the borderline. <laughs> You're like a like a Madonna girl. Oh, kind yeah. I, I imagine you in the 80s as like a like a material girl type. Yeah, that you did I, the I whole had Madonna. some bangs. I had some bangs the going. A little bang situation. Mm-hmm. That's what I expect. I was more the Belinda Carlisle type. Yeah. One thirty in the morning is when the 948-foot cargo ship Dolly, a Singapore-flagged vessel en route, we're told, to Sri Lanka, mm. crashed into the key bridge. Uh, what appears again to be a, an engine failure and or power failure in the events leading up to that collision. Uh, it shows the ship losing power with the lights going off completely and then lights coming back on off again, on again, right before impact. Uh, we also have seen the video here. It looks like it's a fixed security camera of the of the Baltimore Harbor. It shows continuous traffic going across the bridge for quite some time. Uh, but then that traffic ceases. You can see yellow construction vehicle lights right at the center of the span, as we're told there was ongoing you know, continuous construction going on on this bridge that is over 40 years old. Uh, right before the impact, the traffic on the bridge seems to stop because there's no more headlights going across the bridge. Uh, the only lights that you see on the bridge right before impact are the yellow flashing hazard lights of those construction vehicles. Uh, so it does appear as though if this ship did in fact uh, lose its engines and lose control, that they radioed in and let people know, and it appears as though the traffic was stopped. Otherwise, there's no other explanation as to why suddenly, right before impact, there's no more cars uh, traversing across the bridge. Yeah, um, uh, at the the people on the ship, um, I think it was eight uh, crew members mm-hmm. are, have all been accounted for, and the two pilots, um, again, have been accounted for, and there's no injuries on the ship, on the cargo ship. Now, we have been able to see a graphic image of the uh, in sort of an overhead, almost like a Google Maps shot of the harbor. And, you know, every vehicle in the world now seems to have a tracking device of sorts where you can isolate one vehicle, in this case, this cargo ship, the Dolly, and just show its route. It left the port, it left uh, its its dock, and then did a complete U-turn and headed out toward the the exit of the harbor, which, of course, involves going under the widest expansion of this Francis Scott Key Bridge. And then, inexplicably, you can see that it makes a, a turn to the starboard side. It, it turns to the right, basically. And from the overhead shot of the trajectory of the ship, it it's going exactly dead on into this pylon. That would be the moment, it appears, where it lost power, lost engines, lost control, and was basically a giant, drifting, hazardous yeah. Yeah. vehicle yeah. Um, as they tried to regain power. Just, uh, this, by the way, the images that we see and what we've uh, determined here and communicating to you is coming uh, from the Baltimore Fire Department as well as they've been releasing images and they will have a press conference in less than an hour to give more details on the rescue effort as well, which is, of course, hampered by the twisted steel 
of the collapsed bridge right now in that cold water. Yeah, and just be careful, particularly if you're on X, formerly known as Twitter. Um, <laughs> there are a lot of fake videos going around. Um, there's yeah. one that's, I, I believe it, it's from an, a bridge explosion that happened in Europe and people are in tweeting Crimea, it out. Yeah, Crimea, yeah. Crimea and people are tweeting it out. Of, yeah, the, 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 the bridge actually, it, it does not look, I think I think there was a fire on the ship itself, but there's no there was no big explosion. It was right. it was a collapse and into the water and no big. So if you see pictures and videos of bridges exploding, that that is fake. Yeah, a big, a big exploding fireball. That is yeah. not the situation here with this bridge. You know, one other aspect, uh, and we do have more in the news, and we will uh, bring you more news as the morning develops, too, by the way. It's not going to be all bridge all the time here because, well, we're still learning more about the bridge. We will deliver it as we get it. But one part of the story that hasn't been discussed yet as we continue to look at the rescue effort, and the last report said up to 20 people are unaccounted for, and that rescue effort continues, is... Um, Obviously, the impact on traffic and commerce and the delivery of products on I-695. But also, Julie, Baltimore Harbor is one of the busiest harbors on the East Coast. This harbor in the mid-Atlantic receives cargo and receives deliveries for the entire nation. Yeah. Uh, and to the southern states as well as the New England states and all through the Midwest and the South the impact on not being able to traverse the river for quite some time until this is cleaned up and the fact it's, that ships cannot come yeah. in and out of Baltimore Harbor oh. is going to have a severe impact. Yeah, and you know, this is also, a, you know, a big first responder incident and Baltimore has an inc a very dangerous uh, problem with police shortage shortages right now. Mm. So that city is already struggling from a crime perspective, drug use, all of that, and again, a huge problem with um, recruitment and retaining police officers. So this is this is very worrisome. They just yeah. don't have the infrastructure in place um, really to handle something like this. So it's it, it, this is going to be very disruptive to the city. This is the, one of the nation's largest shipping hubs. And according to the Maryland State website, it generates uh, over $3 billion in personal income, over $2.5 billion in business income, uh, up to $400 million in taxes, mm. uh, 52.3 million tons of international cargo last year in Baltimore Harbor, which is now basically on hold until this cleanup effort can commence. Good news, though, Julie, I've got there. No one needs to worry. Because Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg <laughs> has put out a statement. Oh. He has spoken to the governor. So it's good to know the governor's awake because we, we weren't sure about that yet. Uh, spoken to the mayor. Offer anything that the Department of Transportation can provide. He also said this. Are you ready? This is, this is the message from your Secretary of Transportation, Pete Buttigieg. Quoting him now. Rescue efforts remain underway and drivers in the Baltimore area should follow local responder <laughs> guidance on detours and response. So oh. I don't know where we would be without him. He is one of the brightest shining lights. You know, without without American him, people might have just service. still tried to go over the bridge. Well, exactly. Exactly. So thanks. Thanks, thanks Secretary thanks, Pete. Pete. Is this how he handled the pothole problem in South Bend before he yes. got the promotion? Yes. He had a lot of experience with bridges. I don't think there's any body of water at all in South Bend, Indiana. <laughs> Maybe his backdoor swimming pool, you know, his backyard the baby swimming pool. pool. The plastic 615, pool. WMAL traffic and weather every 10 minutes. First on the five, Steve Hershorn's in the Hadid Carpet Cleaning Traffic Center. WMAL. Making sense of the news. Live. From the Home Paramount Pest Control Studios. Home Paramount, the leader in pest control since 1939. News is brought to you by New Look Home Design. From headlines to hilarity, it's the Vince Colonnay Show, weekdays 3 to 6, right here on WMAL. 617 now, and uh, Julie, we've got a little bit of news here outside of the collapsed bridge in Baltimore. And by the way, the press conference apparently has been pushed up. It's going to be developing any moment now, and we'll deliver you whatever news and updates we get from elected officials and first responders. Uh, fresh off the heels of a uh, what appears to be uh, a bit of a verbal slip by Congressman David Trone. 
in the middle of a congressional hearing last week on Thursday. Uh, now there's been an alignment of Democrats backing his opponent. Mm. A, a, a county executive of Prince George's County, Angela Also Brooks, is running for the Democrats' nomination, and she's just received Jamie Raskin's endorsement. Just you know, that's a bit of a slap in the head. Raskin serves with Trone on a daily basis uh, yeah. right now in Congress. Their districts are bordering each other. They're best pals. But it might be be part of this this well what we can only call a verbal slip from Congressman Trone last week. And government businesses don't make decisions on investment, which creates the jobs based on the tax rate. I've made in my past life hundreds of millions of dollars of decisions each year on budgets and to build new buildings, build enter new states, and not one time ever in the history of my life did I say, "What's the tax rate next year?" What you look at is, can you compete? Can you do it better than the other competitor? And with that, can you create a P&L statement that works? Mm. And the tax rate, that's after the P&L. Mm. It's never, ever once been a consideration. So this Republican jigaboo that, you know, it's a tax rate that's stopping. Yikes. Oh. He claimed in an. Uh, I, I, I didn't. I've never heard that word. I don't know what that is. Yeah, so. Really? It's a racial slur. Okay. Yeah. I did. But I. Yeah. And he claims, sorry, I don't mean to be surprised. No, I've never heard that. uh, Well, apparently David Trode has on a regular basis. Otherwise, why is that even? Why is it in your vernacular? Yeah, exactly. Uh, He he said in his apology that he meant bugaboo. Mm -hmm. But interestingly, this happened on Thursday. Over the weekend, five Democrats came out and endorsed also Brooks, who is Mm. black. Yes. And those five Democrats all black mm. announced their support that's including representative barbara lee of california george meeks of new york joyce Beatty of ohio yvette clark of new york and jasmine crockett of texas uh now uh, jamie raskin uh, who is probably the whitest man in america not black at all uh, but he is a very powerful and influential democrat as he has become sort of the bete noir of Republicans and most specifically Donald Trump, because here's the thing about Jamie Raskin. He likes to peddle in conspiracy theories a lot. And he likes to he's sort of the East Coast version of Adam Schiff. <laughs> yes, that's a right? perfect description. Um, but this is a huge endorsement. And this is a race based on the last polling that showed Trone, yes, with a lead, but a very narrow one mm. over also Brooks. But let's not forget, Trone also has a whole lot of total wine and more money at his expense uh, yeah. disposal. So he'll be able to pump as much money as he wants wants to put in there. He also has the backing of House Minority Leader Hakeem Jeffries. Mm. But that was before Jeffries learned about uh, the colorful language that David Trone likes to use. So this Republican jigaboo that... Yeah, so you, you shouldn't say that. Yeah. Should, that's not a thing Obviously. to say. Yeah. yeah. Um, this, it, 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 is, it also says something that he throws around words like that. Like, what what is that doing in your vocabulary? That's mm. um, really odd strangely though and i don't know if this is going to work out for her but angela also brooks campaign slogan is i'll do for maryland what i've done for prince george's county oh, which great. yikes i don't know if that's does she get it <laughs> I mean, i'll bring the best of i mean i, I mean, love prince george's awful. county there's some beautiful parts of prince george's county yes. but i mean it's it's not like people are flocking to go there right it has challenges i guess what i want to say mm. Prince George's County has challenges. Indeed. But we'll see. It does make the Republican prospects look a little bit better. And, of course, the latest polls show that Governor Larry Hogan is leading for the Republican nomination and is leading both Trone and also Brooks in a uh, anticipated matchup. But, of course, there's still a lot of games still to be played in the Republican primary process. And uh, we've heard from most of those candidates and will continue to. Uh, put them before you so that you can make an informed decision. Right now at 623. Heard that word that racial slur David Trone used is yeah. actually kind of. Remember, Senator George Allen, governor of Virginia, his entire political career was spiked because oh, yeah. he, he said macaca, which no one had ever heard. Before. I'd never heard of that. Well, because it's not a real word, but suddenly they decided that was a slur and yeah. his career was ended. How does David Trone survive this? Yeah, well, we've seen this double standard before, Larry. Wow. Now. On 105.9 FM and streaming worldwide on the WMAL app. O'Connor and Company.
Yeah, six thirty-seven here. A very busy morning, and uh, thank you to Bill Vanko here. By the way, a new voice to our listeners who is in for John Matthews this week, and boy, he just got thrown right into the fire of a major breaking story. This is the kind of story that comes along once every fifty years in this area. The entire collapse of the Francis Scott Key Bridge in Baltimore Harbor as a result of a collision with a a cargo ship, a cargo well, technically the cargo ship collided into the pylon of the bridge. The bridge did not collide into anything. Bridges don't collide, Larry. This is what happens, Julie Gunlock, when we have a <laughs> breaking story that we're communicating uh, on the fly. We'll give you more details on this as the rescue efforts from up to 20 people uh, continues here mm-hmm. as the sun is just starting to streak across the sky. In the Baltimore area, official sunrise is still another 20 minutes away, but uh, it'll be a lot easier once they see exactly, and and we'll be able to see the extent of this crumpled steel from this bridge. Uh, Joining us right now, Richard Goldberg, Senior Advisor to the Foundation for Defense of Democracy, sadly, to comment on what appears to be the crumpled state of U.S.-Israeli affairs as the U.N. Security Council yesterday passed a Gaza ceasefire resolution forcing a ceasefire on to the people of Israel and the elected leaders of Israel who do not want this. It's not part of their strategy to execute this war. And the United States, to its shame, Richard Goldberg, abstained Mm. from voting. They could have vetoed this, and they didn't, Richard. That's exactly right. Uh, Obviously, they have put forward other resolutions before that the Chinese and Russians uh, were not afraid to veto. Somehow our adversaries stand up for their interests to undermine ours, but we in this administration are afraid to stand up for our own interests and our allies when they oppose uh, our our resolutions. But, you know, the the backdrop of all of this was the weekend was filled with negotiations in Qatar with the Israelis, the American CIA director, the Qataris, the Egyptians, and Hamas negotiating over a hostage release and a ceasefire. And the Israelis, under pressure from the Americans, offering more and more and more And what's the only leverage they have to get hostages out from Hamas? It's the threat that they're going to go forward and destroy Hamas. It's Mm -hmm. the only reason why Hamas would negotiate. So why in the middle of waiting for Hamas's response would you go to the Security Council and allow a resolution that disconnects the call for ceasefire from the call for hostages be be released, makes no mention of October 7th, no condemnation of Hamas whatsoever? And sure enough, what do we learn this morning when we wake up? Not just news out of horrific news out of Baltimore, by the way, but we also now learn that Hamas has officially rejected the offer, and the Israelis have pulled their negotiating team out of Qatar. Totally predictable. And uh, uh, I'm told the Prime Minister Netanyahu has now canceled a trip that he had scheduled to Washington. Ha- have we ever, in the in the 75 years of the existence of the state of Israel, have we ever seen relations between these two countries this bad? Uh, I think about the times during the Obama administration, the battle over the Iran nuclear deal. There was a sneak attack uh, politically on Israel towards the end of the Obama administration when they allowed a a terrible Security Council resolution to go forward that basically declared Jerusalem, parts of Jerusalem, the capital of Israel, to be occupied territory. That's right, Mm. yeah. Uh, And and so so I do sort of remember those kind of times. I would just say, though, Richard, the difference there is we didn't— they. We didn't have Hamas currently holding hostages and, what, five months from a a horrific terror attack that killed over a thousand people. I mean, as bad as that was, this is frankly more disgusting. No, our ally on the battlefield at the moment. Would this administration ever do that to Ukraine right now? Would they go to the Security Uh, Council and back a pro-Putin resolution to cut off Ukraine and say they must have a ceasefire? No. Why did they allow that for Israel? Why the double standard? Always, always the, because it's political. But, but I want to know, has, have House Republicans or Senate Republicans responded? Have they done anything in light of this, um, at, you know, abstention? Have they have they said anything? I think some individual members have, have said certain things, but it's, I, I think long past time for the leadership to move yeah. forward on at least resolutions that put every member of Congress on record. Where do you stand right now? Yeah. Are you with Hamas? Are you with Israel? And I think that would repudiate what the president just did and signal to Hamas, signal to Iran, its sponsor, signal to the rest of the world. The president's policy does not reflect the vast majority Mm -hmm. of the American people. He reflects the vast majority of a few thousand people in Dearborn, Michigan. Exactly. That is not the will of the American people. Richard, I, I... 
honestly, I, I, I'm so disgusted by this move and the fact that it was an abstention. You know what? If you want to just stand for a bad policy, stand for the bad policy. They they didn't vote in yeah. favor of forcing this. They thought they could get away with it by, by being a cutesy little abstention. That's frankly even weaker. What message are we sending, not just to Hamas in Iran, but all of our enemies around the world, that first we would throw an ally under the bus like this. Secondly, the fact that we don't even stand for our own betrayal. We're just going to stand back and allow it to happen without actually participating. And the U.S. should not abstain in anything. We're either for something or we're against it. And abstention is even worse. It's such a good point. And I go back to this idea on Friday. Biden pushed forward his own resolution. I was critical of it. It was not a good resolution. Still put pressure on Israel not to go forward with the ground operation in Rafah, which is set up to be Hamas's last stand uh, in Gaza. But at least he called out Hamas and called out October 7th and connected a ceasefire to release of hostages. Yeah. Russia and China, big allies of Iran and Hamas, they didn't hesitate to use their veto. But we can't stand up for our ally because why? It's going to be difficult at cocktail parties in New York for your right. diplomats Yeah. because the, the, the crazy radical left folks that are serving in your administration want you to support it. But the rest of the American people would condemn you for supporting it. So you don't know what to do. So you look completely weak and just abstain. Right. Totally agree. Total yeah, it is. It's, and and you're right to point out this is about suburban Michigan, not That's just right. the votes, but also the political action. Uh, if you look at who mans the polls and many of the people who are involved in volunteering to count ballots and mail in ballots, mm. eh, very much Rashida Tlaib's constituency. That's right. And that's a big part of this in Wayne County, Michigan. And Oakland County, Michigan, as well. Uh, we got to leave it there. Richard Goldberg, thank you. Sadly, for an outrageous story, mm. uh, it's uh, it's despicable, and I'm, we're glad you're there with the Foundation for Defense of Democracies. Thank you, sir. Thanks for having me. It is six forty-four. All right, just moments ago, uh, Baltimore officials uh, conducted a brief press conference, uh, sort of laying out what we know and what we don't know with regard to the uh, bridge collapse, as well as the rescue efforts. I want you to listen to a little bit of it here. Uh, here we go. We have a large area that we have to search. This includes on the surface of the water, subsurface, as well as on the deck of the ship itself. We believe at this point we may be looking for we may be looking for upwards of seven individuals. That's the latest information we have. However, what I will say is, is the information that I'm giving you right now is as of right now. That's what we know right now. Um, this is a very large incident. It involves a very large footprint. Multiple agencies are operating. Therefore, information is subject to change as we get more intel um, and as our crews work through the morning. Um, over the next 8 to 12 hours, you can expect to continue to see um, our air and maritime assets functioning um, out on the water and in the air above. Uh, we need to do damage assessment of, of the ship itself before we can board that ship. Um, and we need to continue our subsurface search, which is including um, different types of sonar. We have side scan sonar. We have other sonar capabilities here. We have underwater um, UAVs that we're working with. And throughout the night, we've also been working with uh, infrared technology, both from the air and on the water surface. So um, I'm going to wrap up here with just saying this continues to be a search and rescue operation. It continues to be a very dynamic operation with multiple local, state and federal resources involved. All right. In addition to that, we also know that two people have been rescued, one of them miraculously without any injuries. The other is in serious condition and was unable to talk with rescuers, uh, and the search continues for others. Uh, again, I'm trying to put the pieces together of what we know and what we don't know yet. Uh, what we know from the video footage that we have been discussing all morning long is that as the cargo ship, the Dolly, which is a Singapore flag cargo ship en route to Sri Lanka, leaving Baltimore Harbor, as it was approaching the Francis Scott Key Bridge, you could see that there was a power failure of sorts, and, and we're hearing reports also of engine failure on this ship. 
um, people that we know that uh, either in the Coast Guard or the Navy who have been commenting with us all morning have said you, when that sort of thing happens, usually, especially if you're approaching a bridge or other sort of update, you drop anchor immediately. That's the protocol. Yeah. Um, so you don't drift mindlessly into a uh, into a bridge. So there will be questions raised about about whether that happened or if why it didn't happen. Number one. Um, what? But but we also see uh, just quickly, um, as I've mentioned before, on this footage, you see ongoing traffic just just, you know, flowing across that bridge. But then about a minute or so before the impact, it appears as though that traffic stops. And one, I, I'm still trying to get details as to whether the ship alerted authorities and they were able to stop the traffic because the fact that there's only seven people, I mean, listen, seven is seven too many, and God forbid that those people can't be rescued. But the fact that seven well, is the number, considering the kind of traffic that bridge was ha experiencing at 1.30 in the morning, it, suggests that there was some sort of alert. But exactly. You know, you mentioned you, if you watch the whole video, there's quite a lot, not a lot, but there's a regular pace of cars going over that mm -hmm. bridge and trucks. Uh, and it's important to remember that this is the designated hazmat uh, bridge for Baltimore. So uh, any truck carrying um, hazardous materials has to go over this. So lots of trucks go over this this bridge. And there are. There are several semi-trucks yeah. and other trucks. And But you see cars, too. And then it's weird. It just stops. Yep. Um, the emergency it vehicles are still on the bridge, but the cars do stop. So it makes you wonder. Um, I have also seen a tweet out there that's saying um, – they are supposed to, you know, there's a series of honks that they're supposed to do with their horn. Mm -hmm. um, ma for emergencies. No, yes, for impact. emergencies. Yeah. There's no no sound on this video, so I don't know if right. that was done. I don't know if they did issue a warning and someone managed to stop traffic. But right. um, but considering the number is seven, obviously horrible and tragic, and we hope that they are found. But um, There are it, definitely vehicles that went in the water. Yeah, Those yeah, emergency yeah. vehicles, and it looks as though a couple of others. But again, the, the number so far, considering the scale of this and the catastrophic nature of this impact and collapse, it's so far, well, well let's just keep our, our prayers going because they seem to be working. Right now it's 6.53. We've got more from this press conference that we'll share with you as the morning goes on.